Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to continue our scholarly examination of Alien Worlds, the science fiction anthology from the mid-80s. This is number eight, the first issue published by Eclipse Comics. Um, around this time, Pacific Comics, which had published the first seven issues, had gone out of business. Eclipse brought a whole, bought a whole bunch of properties from Pacific as when they went under. And really quickly, kind of just started cranking them out. I bought this comic off the stands uh, regularly, and I don't think there was much lag even. I don't even remember much time in between number seven and number eight, even though the company had went out of business. So we start off with a nice John Pound cover. If you don't know John Pound, did a handful of stuff for the undergrounds, mostly remembered for his beautiful colors. He was a very skillful artist, um, one of the early adopters of Airbrush, uh, the, the Airbrush. Did some really nice covers. Did a few interior stories too, but not much because he was so facile and uh, good at what he did. He did a lot of graphic design work, you know. Probably made a lot more money than most underground cartoonists because he had the skills. Um, this is a parody of like the Mars Attacks cards, except updated to the 80s. The first story we have is And Miles to Go Before I Sleep. It's another adaptation of the sci-fi author William F. Nolan. Uh, short stories and art by Al Williamson. It's pretty nice stuff. So uh, it's in the far future. We see this guy Murdoch and he's a spaceman. And this lizard doctor is telling him he's only got two months to live. He contracted this horrible disease. And I guess in the future, uh, medicine's more exact or something. Because he says, you're going to die at mi exactly at midnight on January 20th, 2022. So this guy died a couple of years ago, I guess. So um, he tells him that I'm going back to Earth. And the doctor says, you'll never make it. It's a year's journey. And uh, he says, you're wrong. One year from today, Robert Murdoch, Rocket Man Star Class, will return to Thayerville, Ohio to keep my promise. I bid you adieu, sir. So he's on a spaceship heading to Earth. And he's uh, feeling a little weaker every day. He has a little flashback to uh, when he was a kid. He always wanted to be a spaceman. It was his dream since he was a kid. I just want to point out this panel. I love his reflection in the window here. That's nice stuff. And uh, he's basically reflecting on his life. He's had a pretty good life. He got to live out his dreams because he's just sad that it had to end so soon, you know. So he really wants to get back to Thayerville, Ohio, because his parents, who are elderly and sick, live there. And he basically just wants to uh, make an appearance and bring them a little joy. And his plan? He got the scientist to build him an indiscernible, lifelike robot that looks exactly like him. And no, no one could tell him apart. So the robot is going to take his place. I like this panel, too, of all the crazy asteroids. Really well drawn. So January 20th rolls around. It's midnight. And the robot uh, walks him over to this little... It's like a coffin rocket. Because he's a spaceman, he wants to spend all of eternity just floating through space. The robot tucks him in. That's another nice panel there. I like that. And as he... Uh, his last words, Murdoch's last words are, Goodbye, Mom, Dad, I loved you. And he's ejected out into space. So now we see Earth. The ship has landed. And the Murdoch robot comes out. And the parents are thrilled. And they're loving on him. He's kind of a big wheel. He's kind of like the hometown hero. So all these other people come out. We see these two guys. Once they're out of earshot, the parents and uh, the robot... He, uh, one of them says, well, they vowed their son would never come home to death. And he says, uh, he'll be back in space in two weeks. You know, he'll never find out. They're perfect. I had them built exactly as the will specified. He'll never know. <laughs> so we see these three robots here all pretending to be happy to see each other. And because the parents did the same thing he did. They died. And uh, they wanted their son to have a last, like, nice memory. Kind of a sweet little story. 
This next one's really good. It's called Soft Boiled. It's a story by Bruce Jones, art by Paul Rivich. He's a Canadian cartoonist. Uh, in the 70s, he did stuff for that Andromeda, that sci-fi anthology. Did stuff for Vortex Comics. Later on, did stuff for Vertigo. But he's probably best remembered for doing the initial artwork for, like, um, Mr. X, that uh, comic from the 80s. So we see this guy, Ace Banner. He's the prototypical hard-boiled dick. His narration, you know, is totally like Dashiell Hammett. But he almost seems aware of being in a film noir world. He mentions all these things like, oh, it's like, it's like a Bogart film noir movie that Warner Brothers cranked out. He mentions the, uh, the red neon winking through the Venetians and his old royal upright typewriter tack tacking away under his fingers and a bottle of Jack Daniels at his elbow and a 38 snub nose revolver in his holster. It's very uh, typical. And of course, as is want to happen in one of these stories, a beautiful woman walks in asking for him. Man, I just want to take a second to just look at this beautiful cartoony. It's almost like clear line, like European stuff. Kind of reminds me of Daniel Torres, but less stylized. Just very, um, I don't know. It's just, I love it. It's really good cartoony. I love his style. He's one of those guys who hasn't drawn much either when you look at his whole career because he's a graphic designer. It's very slick. And uh, he makes most of his money from doing that for big companies and stuff. <clears throat> she introduces herself. She says, I'm Kathy Nolan. And she says, this might sound crazy. And, uh, and he interrupts her and says, I've heard it all before, miss. And she says, please call me June. <laughs> and he says, I thought you said your name was Kathy. Kathy, my name is June. He says, skip it. And then she opens her jacket. She's naked. She says, I haven't any money. I'm afraid all I can offer you is this. He kind of pushes her jacket back over. He's like, yeah, we got time for this later. But uh, let's get to the bottom. Let's get to the root of this. What's going on? And she says, someone is trying to bake me. I've been threatened. Bake you? What? You said bake me. Kill me. Someone's trying to kill me. Here, look. And she hands him this note. And he says, this is a grocery list. I know. You know. I left the threat note at home by mistake, but it was terrible. You should have read it. <laughs> and so then she all of a sudden just grabs him and says, kiss me, you bastard. And we see a silhouette of this guy with a machine gun and he sprays the office with lead. They hit the floor and he runs up to the roof, but the guy's gone. When he comes back down, Miss Nolan is typing away. And she says, here's my phone and address. Call me if you got any leads. And when he reads it, it says, all it says is, Bob, Bob, Black Sheep, have you any Spaniel? <laughs> so I love how this like scene reads like a typical film noir, but if it was like adapted by Monty Python, it's just, it's, it's everything's a little askew. So he thinks it's a clue. He, so he goes to the corner of Spaniel Street and Sheepshead Avenue. He sees one of his contacts there, this cabbie named Spivey. And even Spivey's like kind of being off tonight. He's calling him Mr. Banner instead of Ace, like he always does. Back at his office, um, the woman calls him up and she says, Mr. Banner, it's Dorothy Nolan. And he said, Dorothy, I thought your name was June. Whatever. I got another note. It says, meet me at the East Pier at 2 a.m. Signed the rat. So he goes out to the pier and Spivey's there for some reason. And there's no real reason, and he doesn't explain himself. Uh, Ace sees uh, this guy running away. And he sees him running, uh, jumping down this manhole. I don't know why, but this panel to me is so amazing. It just looks like something, a lost panel from Bernard Krigstein or something. It, it's not that special, but I don't know why. I find it very striking. So he runs down to the sewers, chasing this guy. And he starts hearing this thrum noise like a rumbling. And when he rounds the corner, he sees this robot city, all these robots diligently working, building up this this uh, city. And this giant robot comes out. And he says, ah, oh, Mr. Banner, out late tonight, are we? And he says, and Ace says, you guys aren't supposed to be down here. 
I never typed orders for all this. And the robot says, I'm afraid we took this upon ourselves, Mr. Banner. And he says, you better explain yourself. And the robot tells him, he says, uh, basically we're per pursuing development. We've basically, we've matured and uh, we're kind of evolving our, our, our artificial intelligence. And to be honest, we don't have time to indulge you in your fantasies and dress up in peri period clothing <laughs> so you can act out your little immature fantasies. Uh, Miss Banner comes out. She's a robot. And uh, he's kind of pissed off at first. He says, I created you guys. After the rockets fell, I patched up all the computers. And the robot's like, tut, tut, Mr. Banner. And uh, basically, uh, Ace, Ace kind of becomes crestfallen. He says, I should have known when you kept getting your lines wrong back in the office that you weren't concentrating on what I typed. And he kind of says, I really am outdated, aren't I? So what now? What do you do when an old dog has outlived his days? And the robot says, there's very little choice. And he's going to shoot him in the head. But then the female robot says, wait, I have a suggestion. Something that might make Mr. Banner more comfortable. And then we see back at the office. Um, you know, he's living, it's back to the film noir type thing. And Miss Banner walks in and she says, they're after you, Mr. Banner. They mean to kill you. And he says, maybe I could take a few with me. And he hears a knock, knock. They're here. Yeah, how about a goodbye kiss, doll, for old time's sake? What'd you say your name was? <laughs> oh, God, I love that story. I think that's one of my favorites yet in the Alien Worlds, or one of them. Really good stuff. On the other hand, we got collector's item here. Story by Bruce Jones, art by Ken Stacy. And I don't know what the hell happened to Ken Stacy this month, but this is terrible, for especially for Ken Stacy. That guy can draw really well at most times. Strangely enough, it really reminds me of this guy, B.C. Boyer, who had some crappy comics published by Eclipse in the 80s. Really bad artist and, and writer. Um, basically a fan artist, but Eclipse liked him for some reason and gave him color comics even. Nuts. But this is really sloppy Ken Stacy art. So basically we see these two kids. I think it's supposed to be the 50s. And they love collecting Venus Invades trading cards. Obviously an homage to Mars Attacks. Every day they go to the candy store owned by Mr. Foch here. And they pester him. Hey, you got any new cards in? And uh, these are nice. When he does the facsimiles of these cards. And he does a really nice you know, painted art. Very in the style of the Mars Attacks cards. Apparently this blonde kid, he's been looking for this one certain card forever. And the next day, he opens up a pack and he finds it, bombing the White House. But then his friend basically says, well, you know, you'll never get the first card. A lot of people say it doesn't even exist, the very first card in the series. And he's like, I'm going to get it one day. Trust me. It's full of hope. So the next day, like, while the moon's still out, he gets up super early and runs down to the candy store. And the door's open, even though he doesn't see Mr. Foch. So he lets himself in, opens up a pack of cards that's right on the counter. And he says, I got it, the first card. It's Mr. Foch, is that you? And his, his shadow of a tentacle. And then we see the first card, the invasion begins. And Mr. Foch, is, he's a Venusian and he's killing the little kid. We can tell it's Mr. Fox because he's wearing that red cap. He's wearing the whole story. That's <laughs> pretty dopey stuff. And yeah, and there's no excuse for this art, Mr. Stacy. Oh, okay, maybe this is my favorite story ever in Alien Worlds. This is a really good one. It's called Stony End, written by Jan Stranad, the great underground writer. And, you know, obviously other stuff. He did stuff for DC. And, uh, I think even Dark Horse, maybe. But, um, and then art by the great underground artist, Rand Holmes. So this is almost like some great underground comic you never read, except a little cleaner, uh, because it's for Eclipse, not for Last Gasp. But uh, we start off, we see this. Oh, actually, I, I wanted to mention first, though, I think this is the first writer other than Bruce Jones. I guess Ken Stacy wrote that one wordless story that he drew. 
But other than the adaptations of other writers, I think that is the first time Bruce Jones relinquished the writing to someone else. The spaceship has uh, crash landed on an alien planet and due to sabotage. So the captain orders the saboteur brought to him. He's totally unrepentant. And the captain's basically threatening him with a uh, punishment. And he says, too late. Uh, I already bit down on my poison tooth. And it's very fast acting. So he falls over dead. Look at this art here. This is so Rand Holmes indulging his Wally Wood love. His love of Wally Wood. This is so Wally Wood. Amazing, fun sci-fi, EC inspired art. So these uh, vines are growing over the ship, kind of strangling it. The captain orders the electricity to be rerouted to the hull so they can fry the vines off and it works. But then the captain sees this beautiful humanoid alien woman She's pretty much naked. She's running from these kind of scary, repulsive aliens. So he jumps out of the airlock and blasts some of the creatures. And then he says, run for those rocks. We'll hold them off from there. He runs out of ammo and he's like, oh, I guess we're done for. And the alien woman says, for what it's worth, I'll always love you. Me too, honey. Me too. But then the spaceship, I guess the engine has been fixed and they blast the aliens and they're rescued and it's a happy ending. And then we see this word balloon from off screen say, excuse me, Captain, here he is. And then we realize that what we just read was a comic book story that this guy is reading and he's the captain of a starship. And this is so odd. The story is going to mirror the story he just read. But in a totally like more mundane, kind of sad way, it's not going to be nearly as heroic and thrilling as this pulp comic book story. So in this reality, there's no saboteur from an enemy country. It's just this sad uh, pilot who's a drug addict and he's been on a three-day bender. And so he fucked up and the ship crashed because of him. And they're in a much worse predicament than the guys in the comic because there's these worms that like spew acid and they're eating through the hull. I guess they're attracted to metal and they're going to be through in like an hour. They're going to be letting all this poison gas in. So the captain calls for the chief science officer, Stoney, to come down and give him a report. And this is weird. Even though they're about to die, his second in command we don't see Stoney yet, but he says, Woo-wee, would you look at that? Ha-cha-cha. And Stoney's dressed up as a woman, has makeup on and everything. And she says, uh, I've abandoned the safety of the closet to confront death woman to woman. If I must die, let it be with dignity. And she basically informs, informs him the same thing. She says, yeah, th you can't breathe this air. We, we have no ch chance. <laughs> We're fucked. He runs down to the engine room to talk to the chief engineer. He's not even doing anything except playing chess. He's just like, Captain, the engines are gone. The fuel was dumped so we wouldn't explode on, on the crash. We're fucked. Now shut up and let me finish my game. So everyone in this, is, uh, this ship is pretty just fatalistic, just accepting, like, ah, what are you going to do? The worms eat through the hull. So the captain orders everyone to put on their spacesuits and run for this outcrop of rock about 100 yards away. It's kind of a terrifying scene. These worms just attack them because there's metal in the spacesuits. And they just eat through really quickly and they all die of poisoning, of the poison atmosphere. Except for the captain and Stoney, they make it to the rock. I guess the worms can't climb up. But they've only got like 30 minutes left of oxygen. So they're just like... Ah, oh, well, I guess that's it. She, uh, I, I love how they're like, none of them are histrionic or anything. They're just like totally accepting of their fate. I mean, they're sad. I mean, Stone is crying here. And then the captain says, hey, I still got the comic book in my pocket. This will pass the time. Stoney says, can I read it when you're through? Sure. And then Stoney says, is it okay to lay my head on your lap here? I won't if you don't want me to. 
And the captain's a little flustered at first when he says, ah, oh, hell, why not? What did I have to lose? What do I have to lose? She says, you're a good man, Captain. I've thought that for a long time. I shouldn't say this, but for what it's worth, I'll always love you, Captain. Me too, Stoney. Me too. Oh, what a great ending. Oh, I love it. Just the pessimism of it. And the James Strad always wrote st stories like that, like in Slow Death, you know. Just, I don't think he had much faith in humanity. He uh, didn't believe in heroes or... But at least these people are decent, you know. But uh, I just love this story. So good and beautiful art by Rand Holmes. So there you have it, guys. A much better than average issue of Alien World. So I'm really happy with this issue. I hope you enjoy, enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, also, I hope to see you here next time at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.